The Night Beat starts right now. Body cameras capture their behavior, but are they enough to hold officers accountable? The defenders take a look at San Antonio Police Department at a body camera controversy coming up. And plus, one local gas station grabbing attention not for prices at the pump, but for what was found behind the kitchen door. We're going to take a look, but first. And new on the night beat, a good Samaritan's actions. The reason one man is alive tonight. I'm Steve Spreester and I'm Stefania Jimenez. That man was hurt in a motorcycle crash last month that almost almost caused him to lose his leg. Now tonight, Dominic Iverson is in rehabilitation and as he walks or works towards his own recovery, he can't stop thinking about the person who helped to save his life. The only issue he doesn't know who that person is. Mm -hmm. Iverson tells the night team's Jaffney Gray he hopes the story reaches that hero who gave him a second chance at life. When he's not going through physical and occupational therapy, 21 year old Dominic Iverson rolls his wheelchair out to this sidewalk to catch some fresh air. I lost about six inches of my fibula bone. So from about here to right, right here. Iverson has been riding motorcycles since he was 12 years old. I will tell you, I pick the motorcycle over the truck any day. But on this day, September 19th at the intersection of East Houston Street and Walters, San Antonio police say a car failed to yield, turning into Iverson's lane. I believe I did a flip. It's hard to tell because life was spinning so quickly. But um, I landed face down on the pavement. The scar above his eyebrow was the least of his worries. I look back down on my leg, looking down, and my, my, my bone is out and bent in this direction. You know, people start then, you know, swarming me at this point. People who ran inside this gas station and got supplies from owner Ahmed Lukanwala. I was so worried about him when he got hurt like that. They came rushing in and tried to get ice bags from me, water bottles and um, cloth. That stranger who stopped the bleeding is who Iverson is most thankful for. Shockingly conscious, Iverson believes the person removed their shirts to create a tourniquet around his leg. Two of my three arteries um, were severed in the accident and I was bleeding out all over the street. And with that, without that tourniquet, I would have passed away within a few minutes. But he survived. Looking at him recovering, feels awesome. And as he strives to fully recover, he's also on a mission to find the Good Samaritan who touched his life. I want to look them in the eye and I want to let them know that, hey, you saved my life. Like the rest of the years that I live out and anything I accomplish, I want to thank them for. Now, Iverson has gone through three major surgeries and still has more to go, but he asks whoever saved him to contact him directly so he can personally thank his hero. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Wow, we hope that they see this report tonight. Mm -hmm. Now tonight we're going to talk about vaccines in children. An advisory panel for the Food and Drug Administration is going to discuss that very topic tomorrow. Now today, Moderna announced that it tested its vaccine on kids 6 to 11 and found that it was safe and that kids had a strong immune response. Now Moderna is planning to share its data with the FDA. And speaking of that agency, tomorrow one of its panels is going to look at how the Pfizer vaccine works with kids 5 to 11 years old. Pfizer says that its shot is more than 90% percent effective at preventing COVID symptoms. And if the FDA okays Pfizer's shot on kids, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention would then take it up. Now, right now, police are looking for the dump truck driver who ran over a bicyclist. That crash happening this morning on Fran Fran near Highway 90 and South Zarzamora. Now, a man saw it happen while he was driving, and he says that the dump truck driver didn't stop. So he did and he called for help. Now that victim is in critical condition with life-threatening injuries, but now investigators are looking through surveillance video to try and find that driver. A drag race turning deadly on an airport runway in Kerrville. The event drew a crowd behind barricades, but Kerrville police say a 1990 Ford Mustang lost rear traction before sliding off the runway into the crowd. One witness says part of the problem was the barricades ended at the finish line. Victims we're standing just beyond it. Two children were killed, including six year old Daniel Trujillo Jones. That car also hit several members of his family and others. One witness captured part of the chaos. Ryan Mitchell says he saw the impact. The moment when he crossed the finish line and the, the nose of his car was looking right at me, um, 
you know, my first instinct is to make sure that my family is okay, first and foremost. Then I turned back around and then, you know, within a, the blink of an eye, literally the car was 10 feet in front of my face. And I was looking at the driver as he continued to slide past me. I saw the impact. So we asked organizers of the event about safety procedures. They declined to comment on their social media pages. They said they were cooperating with the Kerrville Police Department. We also asked the city of Kerrville for a response. They deferred us to the Kerrville Police Department, who continues to investigate the crash. We also sent our questions to Kerr County officials and have not yet heard back. They're supposed to improve relations between police and the very communities that they serve. Of course, we're talking about body worn cameras, but a months long investigation by our defenders found that even when San Antonio police officers are accused of violating the department's policy for those cameras, very rarely are they suspended. Yeah, the night team's Dylan Collier breaks down the numbers and speaks to a prominent activist who calls those figures a step in the wrong direction. Do I look like your Say it right. Put an R at the end. Years after this audio was made public, it continues to shock the conscience, not only by the racial slurs that cascaded from San Antonio police officer Tim Garcia's mouth in the summer of 2018 while confronting a young black man at a downtown mall, but because of the fact that Garcia was able to win back his job the following year. The department's failed attempt to keep him off the force would have likely not even reached that level had Garcia failed to turn on his body-worn camera. Part of this changing the culture of policing is making sure that those that are committing misconduct are being disciplined for their actions. Ananda Thomas helped launch the efforts to reform SAPD through Proposition B a ballot measure that would have repealed collective bargaining rights for the city's police officers had it not ultimately been struck down by fewer than 3,500 votes this summer. Thomas now serves as executive director for Act 4 SA, an organization continuing the push to reimagine public safety in San Antonio. The point of body cameras is transparency and accountability and that's to the entire community. Data provided by the department shows from June 2018 to this June, SAPD officers recorded over 5.6 million videos, resulting in 256 allegations of body-worn camera violations. In only 42 of those cases, about 16% of the time, was an officer actually suspended one day or longer. Suspension records show these violations are often tacked on to other rules and fractions, or amount to just a couple days of no pay. SAPD officials refused to make anyone available to speak on camera for this story, but in a written statement defended the low suspension numbers, pointing out that the circumstances surrounding a specific violation guide the range of punishment, and that an officer may not receive a suspension for an initial camera infraction, but may receive increased discipline for a subsequent violation. This progressive discipline model does not sit well with Thomas. Uh, if an officer knows they can get away one, two, three, four times, whatever it is, without activating their body camera, whether it's the audio, the visual, or both, there's an issue there. There's no punishment for them to learn accountability and to change that behavior. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Ananda Thomas was also critical of SAPD's body-worn camera video release policy, claiming the department has yet to establish clearly defined rules for what is and isn't released and how much video the public actually gets to see. The San Antonio Police Department has said videos related to domestic violence would not be released unless the, unless the chief believes they will serve a law enforcement purpose. The videos the department has released under this policy have been edited and include a version with police narration over parts, not the entire footage. So here's a question. Was it murder or self-defense? That is exactly what a jury is trying to decide in the trial of a man accused of killing his wife. The defendant that we're talking about is 73-year-old Luis Benevento. He was married to Alicia Willis for nine months when she was killed in May of 2019. The defense is claiming that Willis pointed a weapon at Benevento before he defended himself. But prosecutors are saying that Benevento murdered his wife. And in court, they played a 911 call that captured the very last moments of the victim's life. Listen. 
But Avento's expected to take the stand this week, and he faces five to 99 years in prison if he's found guilty. They stood on the side of the U.S. amid America's longest war, all of them fleeing their own country after the Taliban took over. Tonight, we're learning more about the refugees who fled Afghanistan. ABC affiliate WRTV reporting Afghan evacuees are leaving Camp Atterbury in waves to resettle across the country in recent weeks. Among the regions for resettlement, San Antonio, though it's unclear how many have flown here within the past two weeks. It was another sticky and humid day outside today. Actually, we topped out at 88 degrees, not far from the record high of 91 set back in 2010. These numbers, though, the low and high will be changing drastically later this week. Still warm and muggy tomorrow. Storm chances tomorrow night. Cold front hits Wednesday. Big changes for the middle and end of the week. We'll talk about it coming up. Thanks, Adam. A local gas station gets a visit from food inspectors. We go behind the kitchen door for the disturbing discoveries coming up. Also, we're learning more about that deadly shooting on a movie set in New Mexico. We're going to talk about what we know about the man who handed Alec Baldwin a weapon. Up next, that's on the night beat. New revelations tonight in that movie set shooting out of New Mexico. Experts are saying that the assistant director who gave Alec Baldwin that so-called prop gun shouldn't have had a gun in the first place. An AD should never be touching a gun. They can ask for a safety inspection. They can ask questions, but they should never. No crew member other than the armor or the talent should be touching a weapon ever. So affidavits revealed that the AD didn't even know that there were live rounds in that gun. Now, Baldwin fired that prop gun last week during a rehearsal, and it killed director of photography Helena Hutchins and also injured the director. The assistant director who handed Baldwin that prop has been identified as Dave Halls. And two people who work closely with Halls say that people had made safety and behavior complaints about him back in 2019. And they also say that a production company fired him after a gun accidentally went off on set. Now, Halls himself has not yet commented. Back here at home, it is not a pretty picture. Rodent waste found behind the kitchen door of a local gas station. The violation also coming with a warning from food inspectors. Metro Health visited a Shell gas station near Fair Avenue and I-37 last month. In their report, they suspended the facility's restaurant license after kitchen staff was seen preparing food in a kitchen infested with at least rodent waste. Records are also showing rodent waste was found on shelves, behind equipment, on food boxes. The gas station warned they could be handed a $2,000 fine if food sales were to continue. Oh, good news now because that was pretty yucky. So yeah. more local college students are about to achieve the American dream. And that's because the University of Texas at San Antonio is expanding its free tuition program. We've told you before about Bold Promise. That program covers tuition and fees for Texas students who graduated in the top 25 percent of their high school. Now, UTSA is raising the family income threshold from 50 grand to 70 grand a year. Those new changes are going to take effect next fall. And by the way, this program has helped 1,700 students since 2020. That's great. All right, let's check out live cam right now. They, we are sh showing a home <laughs> yes. of a family in the Stone Oak area tonight near Wilderness Oak Elementary School. And they are having some fun with skeletons every night. Oh, I am loving that display right there. How many skeletons can you count? Uh, one, two, two, three, three four. four, little bitty ones. I mean, that's a marching band yeah. right there. And every day it's something different. Yes. That's the key. There's different theme they're doing. So they even had a Good Morning San Antonio set. You know, when it and comes to the anchors, when it comes to this Halloween display, it is all bones about it. Golly, I knew it was you coming. <laughs> Stephanie, it's not too late to uh, admit, change your mind. <laughs> Gosh. All right. Okay, let's talk about the weather here. We've got some big changes on the way, especially by Wednesday, and that's with a cold front that's going to hit us. Now, the cold front, the most noticeable difference temperature-wise will be in the morning readings. We're going to go from mornings in the 60s and low 70s tomorrow 
down into the upper 40s and lower 50s later this week by Thursday, and that's going to last into the upcoming weekend. All right, let's get right to it. Talk about our overall weather pattern, what's causing this, what's going to give us some rain chances, and a look at our future cast, of course, as well. Lone Star State pretty quiet right now. Just some cirrus clouds coming in from the south. Those will continue to increase as the remnants of what was Hurricane Rick moves through central Mexico and continues to push our way. Basically, it's some upper level moisture. It's not going to have a big impact on our rain chances or rain potential here. But look at this activity off in the western U.S. It's been several days in a row of heavy rainfall in parts of drought stricken California, Oregon, and now moving into Utah, the Rocky Mountains where we have the drought. This has been good to see, but this sharp dip in the upper level flow that's causing all this, that's going to move our way and we're going to get hit by that early on Wednesday. So Tuesday night into early Wednesday, that's our next chance of storms and really our only chance in the foreseeable future here. Uh, let's talk about tomorrow though. Let's go through time. We'll start the day with the low clouds. We're accustomed to that here. We've had basically fog and low clouds every day for the past week. It's just going to be a repeat performance into the afternoon. This is three o'clock. We break out into a little bit of sunshine here and there, and we also can't rule out just a quick passing sprinkle or two or very brief shower, especially east of I-35. So along the coastal bend here, Hallettsville, Quero, Victoria, Goliad, Beeville, even Falls City, Carn City area. You could have a quick little shower tomorrow. Not a big deal, nothing to plan around. It's tomorrow night. Notice 2 a.m. Wednesday. That's when the cold front starts to move into our area. Showers and storms along that front likely moving into the hill country Edwards Plateau after midnight tomorrow night and then through the pre dawn hours working its way eastward and even clipping San Antonio. There is the chance of some localized severe thunderstorms, especially north of Highway 90 tomorrow night on towards sunrise on Wednesday morning. But notice by 9 10 a.m. It's out of here and then the wind picks up. That's one of the key changes here. Look at this Wednesday wind gusts likely between 30 and 40 miles per hour. So we often see the wind pick up with these fronts, especially the strong ones. This is going to be no exception. Very gusty behind that front for a couple of days, Wednesday and Thursday. But let's talk temperatures right now. 74, of course, humid dew point is 71, uh, but temperatures for the most part, 70s to still hanging on to low 80s in the typically warmer spots southwest of town. Crazel Springs 82, Catula 83, add to it the mugginess. It's very sticky outside with those dew points in the lower 70s. But you know what these cold fronts do? Sweep away the humidity and that's going to happen basically Wednesday through the weekend. You're not even going to think of the word humidity or mugginess or stickiness at all. Tomorrow's our last real humid day and with that humidity fog to start the, the morning with the morning commute. A few isolated showers possible 71 in the morning 86 the high and then look at that with that cold front. We're looking at some mornings in the upper 40s to lower 50s and highs near 80 with nothing but sunshine. You know, Adam, I just figured a great way to welcome Stephanie at the night beat is a, a good dad joke. <laughs> and a good, good? Did he say good, good dad? Good. <laughs> no. Doesn't exist. Sorry. Prepare yourself. Critics. <laughs> Critics out here. All right. It well, continues. Welcome. Thank Even you. though you didn't appreciate my dad joke here. You're I always do. <laughs> All right. Spurs. Lakers, these are two teams where the age disparity is great. Well, keep in mind, most of the Spurs grew up watching LeBron exactly. play, and now they're playing against him. So what about this age difference? What did they have to say about playing against a legend such as LeBron James tomorrow night with his very young Spurs team? And Jeff Trailer's name popping up in that vacancy at Texas Tech. Coming up. All right, San Antonio Spurs will have their first meeting of the season against the Los Angeles Lakers tomorrow night, and they come into this game with the same record. The Spurs are 1-2, and two, so are the Purple and Gold. That's after the Spurs won their season opener, but lost back-to-back -back games against the Nuggets in Denver Friday and the defending NBA champion Milwaukee Bucks on Saturday, while the Lakers lost their first two games and then last night held off the Memphis Grizzlies 121-118. For most of the Spurs, they grew up watching LeBron James. We're asked today what he has meant to them on and off the court. His value on the court and off the court just will be on, will be known forever. I mean, the amount of things that he has done for everyone off the court, having schools and whatnot, um, and helping people as much as, as he did is um, insane. And what he has done on the court, um, you know, that's what it is expected at a King James. You know, everyone, he's been, you know, he's had the most pressure that I think any basketball player has had since going into high school, going into the pros, and um, he's did a tremendous job doing it. Here's a matchup tomorrow night. We'll be there live starting at 5.
Now that the UTSA Roadrunners are moving a, making a move to the American Athletic Conference, possibly as early as 2023, school officials are already working on another contract extension for head coach Jeff Trailer, even after adding a year to his current deal. But now this, Trailer's name is being mentioned for the vacant head coaching job at Texas Tech after the Red Raiders fired Matt Wells after blowing a 14-point halftime lead against Kansas State. So they better hurry. Even though Trailer doesn't appear to be that kind of a coach that would jump ship this early despite his great success, this year is setting the school record with an 8-0 start that includes the Roadrunners' first ever win in Russell over the weekend in their 45-16 route of Louisiana Tech, especially after getting this team to buy into his triangle of toughness. He seems like a guy who just wants to enjoy the moment during this bye week. There's something about the game of football that's just so unique that it can bring so many different colors, so many different religions, and nobody cares. It's a unique game, and I'm just glad that I've been put in a position to influence a lot of people, make them happy. And uh, when you got players like I do, it's easy to make people happy. Now, the Roadrunners have received national attention, especially after becoming ranked for the first time in school history, moving up to number 23 this week. It's caught the attention of ESPN2, which has decided to broadcast their next game on November the 6th against UTEP and El Paso. Kickoff time has now been moved to 9.15 p.m. on Saturday night. Texas Longhorns went back to work today, coming out their bye week to get ready for number 16 Baylor in Waco this Saturday morning. The Horns are coming out back-to-back -back losses to Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, in which they had the lead in both games and still wound up losing. The head coach Steve Sarkeesian see a level of frustration following their latest loss. Yeah, I think there was a real level of frustration. Uh, I would have been more concerned if there wasn't. Um, you know, I think that the, the, the frustration comes in from I think they know they're capable of doing it, uh, whether it's position specific, player specific, or scheme specific. Um, and then when it when it doesn't happen later in the game, you know there is a level of frustration because I think they know they're capable of getting it done. And you'll be able to see the Longhorns and Bears live on KSAT 12 this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. The big game and our big game covers in the Astros prepare for the World Series next. And our big game coverage features number three and undefeated Johnson Jaguars hosting number eight Reagan Rattlers in a battle for the district title in 28-6-8 and a big neighborhood rivalry. The Jaguars come into this game undefeated 8-0 overall, 6-0 in district behind one of the best running backs in the city, Ben McCreary. It's over 1,100 yards rushing, 18 touchdowns. Their only scare this season was a close call against Madison in just their last game, but held on for the 42-35 win. For the Reagan Rattlers, they're also undefeated in the district at 6-0 with their only two losses to the top two teams in the city to start this season, 35 to 14 lost to number one Brennan 14 to six defeat to number two steel and like Johnson was able to hold off Madison 14 to 11. I played a lot of ball with them growing up a lot of those kids over there and they're a lot of they're all good athletes so you know we really have to work hard this week. It's going to be the biggest game of the year you know we've we've worked all season for a game like this really excited to just come out there and show them what we got. Big time you know uh, this is some of the two uh, juggernauts in this district and you know it's going to come down to the last second so we're just focused on uh, you know doing what we're coached to do and uh, you know performing off of that. And it should be a good one. Kickoff Friday night is at 7 p.m. at Hero Stadium and KSAT 12 Sports will be there starting live at 5. Good luck to the Houston Astros in their quest for their second World Series title. They're taking their first in 2017. This will be their fourth trip to the World Series and third in the American League. And this time around, we'll have to face the Atlanta Braves, who will be making their first World Series appearance since 1999, winning three prior to that in 1914, 1957, and 1995. And it all starts tomorrow night with Game 1 in Houston. You know, we're, we're here um, four wins away to, to become world champions once again. So, um, you know, we want to go out there, make it special, and, and hopefully win it all. All right, we'll see how long it goes. We're predicting maybe perhaps six games. Oh, that's what we are predicting, Is huh? That me? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it's been that long since the Braves were there. Yeah, we're actually in the World Series, yeah. 99. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Tomorrow's our last warm and humid day, mid 80s, very sticky and mostly cloudy. Can't rule out a stray sprinkle, but storm chances tomorrow night through about sunrise on Wednesday. Then we're looking at nothing but blue skies, low humidity and more fall like temperatures for the middle and end of the week. Pumpkin spice latte, uh, weather, that's what I say. There right. you go. That's it for the night beat GMSA at 430. Thank you so much for choosing us. Have a great night.